In the 1960s, American artists began to imagine how they could expand beyond traditional art practices and the confines of the white box gallery. This interest led them to working outside of art spaces altogether, turning towards the natural environment instead. Working with materials from and within the land, artists explored the complicated relationship between nature and humans, a concept that would come to define what is now known as a land art movement. Some scholars have since critiqued the movement for lack of awareness about their environmental impact. However, there were certainly artists who were using this new wave of thought to bring awareness to real issues concerning environmental damage. It is this awareness that would inspire a new generation of artists dedicated to challenging climate injustice. For them, collaborative and collective action provided a model to address environmental issues more effectively than the earlier generation. As this essay will demonstrate, while land artists were beginning to consider the impacts of humans on the environment, the activist art movement that started in the late 1980s set a new precedent for how art could be used for direct action. This influence, coupled with discontent for American capitalism that had grown since the 1960s, would come to inspire a new wave of collective art practices that would use direct action in their art to protest climate injustice. There are various issues that these collectives focused upon, but one issue stands out more than the others. The effects of the fossil fuel industry on indigenous land. There are two art collectives in particular who are utilizing collaboration, direct action, and the arts to challenge the harmful effects of patriarchalism. The House of Tear Carvers of the Lumination and Winter Count. The 1960s can be defined as a socio-political awakening. The Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, growth in feminist thought, and an eagerness to break away from outdated institutions were just a few of the events that took place during the decade. Artists quickly responded to the rapidly changing American landscape, intentionally or not. As Jeffrey Kastner explains in the preface to the book, Land and Environmental Art, the early land art movement aimed to dismantle the authority of the art world through projects that could exist outside of over-commodified art institutions. Land artists such as Walter Di Maria, Robert Smithson, and Michael Heiser were interested in how they could manipulate the environment into a finished work of art. Their work can be characterized as adding, removing, or displacing natural materials to create a sculptural form that brought attention to the connection between the exist existing site and human intervention. Michael Heiser's Rift, created in 1968, is an example of this method of creation. The monumental zigzag replicated the natural landscape and operated as a man-made addition that enhanced the environment. However, this addition did not nearly match that of the mountains, sky, and land that surround it, surrounds it, an intentional aspect of the piece, according to Heiser. Another important component to the piece was its eventual deterioration, highlighting how time and space interacts differently within the human world versus the natural world. This concept of expressing the monumentality of nature through grand sculptural forms is a common one in the land art movement, with artists experimenting with different approaches to capture it. Another method taken on by land artists was the insertion of man-made, non-indigenous materials onto the landscape in order to question what it meant for an object to be natural, and in the case of Nancy Holt's 1973 sculpture, Sun Tunnels, how nature could be controlled. Holt, who often worked with and manip manipulated light in her work, questioned how she could do so with something as large as the sun or moon. Not only was the project meant to be large, a large-scale mechanism used to manipulate light, but it was also a representation of the timelessness of nature and its cyclical nature. While the project aimed to capture the physical presence of time, it also served an, an, as an escape from its vastness. By stepping into the tunnel, viewers are able to take in the desert in a controlled manner, with the carved holes showcasing certain aspects of the environment. In both Sun Tunnels and Rift, the artists are controlling the spaces they are working with to bring awareness to their sublime nature, but also to limit the power of the landscape to a palatable art experience. 
As Helen Gregoris writes in an article for the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Rail about her experience at the Sun Tunnel site, this action is a form of empathy, but at the same time, an artist's colonization of place. Land artists questioned how they could manipulate the environment, how they can control the land, and how their artwork could be used to capture these interactions. It was never a matter of what they could do for the land, but how they could use the land to perpetuate their own idealis idealistic thoughts. The, the prioritization of concept over impact in the land art movement has been frequently critiqued by scholars looking back at the movement retrospectively. Ted Nanicelli in his essay, The Interaction of Ethics and Aesthetics in Environmental Art, questions if the faulty ethics of land art can be excused due to its, due to its successful aesthetic qualities. Nanicelli claims that in order to properly answer this question, one must look at the land artwork with a production-oriented approach, meaning the creation and concept of a work must be considered equally to the finished product. Heiser and Holt's work were not particularly controversial for its impact on the land. However, there are others such as the artist Christo who made a career for themselves based on controversy. Christo created artworks that were both celebrated for their ingenuity and critiqued for their lack of environmental awareness. A project of his that is emblematic of this is Running Vents created in collaboration with fellow artist and wife, Jean Cloud. Constructed between 1972 and 1976, the fence was 24 miles overall and extended east to west near Freeway 100, north of San Francisco and dropping down to the Pacific Ocean at Bodega Bay. Local environmentalists were worried that the fence would disrupt the patterns of animal movement in the area and that the construction of the project as well as, the, as well as the masses of tourists that would come to view the piece would devastate the lush ground cover. Authorities in the area were also concerned that the ecology of the coastline would be disturbed if Cristo was to build into the ocean. Cristo was asked to file an environmental impact report and was forbidden from extending the fence into the ocean. A compromise was made with local protesters after this filing and Cristo agreed to leave areas of the fence open for animal movement, and tourists would only be allowed to view the project from designated paved roads. However, after initially agreeing to keep the fence out of the ocean, the artist ultimately decided this was an integral part of the concept, and he did it anyways. The purpose of running fence was to stand as an artificial boundary line that brought awareness to the arbitrary nature of political and geographical boundaries, which is represented by the technical and legal problems that happened during the fence's construction, as well as the collaborative uh, efforts that went into effect when creating the fence. Even though Cristo did not always consider the impact his artwork would have on the environment, there were artists within the movement who did. These artists did not agree with the perception held by others in the movement that nature was a blank canvas to work with or an indefinitely exploitable resource. While they too were interested in how humans interacted with the natural world, these artists were more concerned with issues of how humans exploited the land. Alan Zonfist was an active participant in the land art movement and created work that addressed the changing urban landscape and its destructive nature. Similar to Heiser and Holt, Sonfist was interested in land as a keeper of time. His most laborious project undoubtedly was Time Landscapes, wherein the artist converted anonymous sites throughout five New York bureaus back to their pre-colonial states, beginning in 1965 and concluding the project in 1978. The most well-known location of the project is located at the corner of LaGuardia Place and Houston Street, north of Soho. Once, the urban, once an urban wasteland, Sunfish revitalized the land in this area by replacing the damaged soil, replanting native vegetation, and reconstructing the original elevation. Sunfish felt it was important to maintain and protect the indigenous, indigenous environment of the city, otherwise its heritage would be lost. 
These mild actions taken to address issues of climate injustice led to later artists expanding upon their ideas in more critical ways. The artists involved in the land art movement were certainly no strangers to protesting capitalistic systems and advocating for, for social political change, but it was rare for the sentiment to be present in their actual artwork. Even artists such as Alan Sonfist, who used their pra artistic practices to rejuvenate the natural landscape, were unsuccessful in using their works to promote genuine change within society or bring awareness to the current social pol political conditions that were contributing to climate injustice. However, the movement was important in laying the foundation for direct action through artistic practices uh, to take hold. Uh, with the 1990s and post-2000s being integral to pushing artists towards activist-based artworks. During the late 1980s and throughout the 2010s, artists and activists began to work together to challenge unjust capitalistic systems in the U.S. While the land art movement's tactics were mild, Art activists amplified their practices to include artistically fueled strikes and protests that would come to create real social change. One of the most profound and successful strike art movements of the late 1980s to 1990s was the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, or ACT UP. ACT UP was founded in New York amid the fears of the HIV AIDS epidemic, declaring themselves a diverse nonpartisan group united in anger and committed to direct action to end the AIDS crisis. The movement not only aimed to challenge institutions such as the government, the pharmaceutical businesses, and the health care system, but they also sought to create a community based in radical support and empowerment. One of their first protests was against the FDA and the pharmaceutical company Burroughs Welcome. ACT UP identified these two entities as acting corruptly in relation to the approval, creation, and disbursement of life-saving HIV AIDS medicine. After a slow approval process, the FDA finally deemed the drug AZT safe for use. However, it was incredibly toxic and cost users more than 10000 a year through Burroughs Welcome. On March 24th, 1987, ACT UP took to the streets with hundreds gathering at Wall Street. Activists blocked traffic in the streets and an effigy of FDA Commissioner Frank Young was hung in order to bring awareness to the institute, uh, institute's in, in action. The protests would receive national attention and in the following weeks, the FDA announced plans to improve upon their approval processes and Burroughs Welcome dropped the price of AZT by 20%. ACT UP was one of, only one of many political movements to pop up between the late 1980s and 2000s that ignited a movement characterized by art activism. It was this change in thought that would come to influence other artists to take on a more active role politically and to expand beyond artwork that was simply an aesthetic object. This moment in postmodernity left lasting effects on the art world and how artists would come to understand the power held in creation. There was another important precedent set, however, and that was the power of collective action. Without the coordinated efforts of artists and activists working together with a shared goal and artistic vision, it is debatable if the ACT UP movement would have been as successful as it was. What were the conditions then that encouraged collectivity between artists and activists? In his book, Delirium and Resistance, Gregory Shillet, a leading scholar on theories concerning artistic collectivity, claims that artistic coll uh, collectivization often flows from moments when capitalism is in crisis or contrarily, when it is delirious with imagined possibilities of endless profi uh, profitability and prosperity. As it relates to issues of climate injustice and the rise in environmental art collectives, however, it seems these groups are not only concerned with the corrupt nature of capitalism, but with its connection to colonialism as well. In 2002, 
Dutch chemist Paul Crutzen wrote an essay in the journal Nature wherein he describes a new epoch in global history that is defined by the negative impact humans are having on the earth, in turn affecting its natural ecological processes, which he has termed the Anthropocene. However, as indigenous artist and theorist Zoe Todd asks, whenever a new term comes to fruition, what other stories could be told here? Heather Davis and Etienne Turpin make clear in their essay, Art and Death, Wives Between the Fifth Assessment and the Sixth Extinction, that the devastation that characterizes the Anthropocene is not simply the result of activities undertaken by the species Homo sapiens. The devastating effects of climate change can be more accurately linked to patriarchalism, a form of capitalism that hinges on the production, exchange, and consumption of petroleum. This system represents the heightened hierarchical relations of humans, the continued violence of white supremacy, colonialism, patriarchy, heterosexism, and ableism, with all of the above exacerbating the damage inflicted upon the non-human world. Capitalism is undoubtedly, undoubtedly a driving force in Earth, Earth's changing environment. However, colonialization is equally to blame for the current state the global ecology is in, so much so that Peter Sloterdijk has suggested calling the human epoch the Eurocene. As TJ Demo describes in his book, Decolonizing Nature, not only did European colonialism result in the governing of peoples, but also in the restructuring of nature. The non-human world was objectified by colonizers and then exploited to its maximum capacity. There are two art collectives who are working dil diligently to bring awareness to these issues and actively creating change through their art activist-based art practices, the House of Tear Carvers of the Lumination and Winter Count. While both collectives utilize methodologies differently, each are using art to challenge the harm that is being caused by patriarchal capitalism, with each acting directly against the fossil fuel industry and its disastrous effects on indigenous land. The first collective was formed from members of the Lumi Nation, the third largest native tribe in Washington state, governing more than 5,000 members and managing 13,000 acres of Thai land on the Lumi Reservation. In order to preserve Lumi traditions, other native ways of life, and to prevent damage to the natural world, the Lumi Nation have taken on countless initiatives against harmless corporations, including the formation of the art collective, the House of Tear Carvers. Every year since 2013, the House of Tear Carvers have taken on a project known as the Totem Pole Journeys, wherein the collective transports a collectively, collectively carved totem pole to other Native communities who are battling fossil fuel threats to their sacred lands and waters. In 2017, the collective made the decision to extend their practices beyond the streets and into the museum. In collaboration with the Natural History Museum, a pop-up and mobile gallery that travels around the country, the House of Tear Carvers created the exhibition Quail Hoy, We Draw the Line, which was installed at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. The exhibition features a collection of artifacts that were gathered during the Totem Pole's 2017 journey, as well as the totem pole that cr was created that year. The aim of the exhibition was to share the stories that the House of Tear Carvers and the Totem Pole had gathered over its travels and to be an act of solidarity with Indigenous peoples across the country. The second collective, Winter Cow, is comprised of the artists Kanupa Hengsa Luger, Dylan McLaughlin, Ginger Dunnell, Merritt Johnson, and Nicholas Gallinin. Similar to the House of Tear Carvers, they use their practice to address the damage being caused by the fuel industry. Working in film, performance, installation, sculpture, storytelling, and sound composition, the collective aims to cultivate awareness, respect, honor, and protection for land and water for all the living things that have lived here 
and for all the living things to come. The collective formed in 2016 as a response to the No Dakota Access Pipeline movement with their project We Are in Crisis being most emblematic of their devotion to the movement. Preparation for the Dakota Access Pipeline began in the fall of 2016 with bulldozers clearing land to create space for the 1,172 mile pipeline that would carry crude oil from the Back and Shell oil fields in Northwest North Dakota to Patoka, Illinois. In protest, Ocheti Sakowin citizens and allies, now known as water protectors, gathered in the thousands at camps near the Missouri River in North Dakota to prevent the completion of the neocolonial infrastructure. We Are in Crisis features disembodied aerial view views of oiled fields, dams, power lines, freeways, and railroads. Overlaying the footage are the distant sounds of rushing water, drum beats, singing, and other sounds from the camps at North Dakota. While the drone slowly moves over the dismantled landscape, a man tells a story of a beast that, that misled society into taking advantage of the land. It is a story about consumption and the misuse of valuable resources. As Jessica Horton explains, the method of indigenous storytelling has been used frequently in the post-2000 art landscape to bring awareness to the environmental crisis. This is a strategy utilized successfully by Winter Count, who through a narrative about an all-consuming monster, expresses how industrial growth and petrocapitalism has destroyed the natural environment that indigenous people have protected for centuries. This speaks to the research done by Demo, who aligns capitalism with colonial ideologies, arguing the two are embedded together. The collectives I have spoken about in this essay, the House of Tear Carvers of the Lumi Nation and Winter Cow, demonstrate how contemporary environmental art collectives are utilizing collaboration, direct action, and the arts to challenge the damaging effects of petrocapitalism. Both collectives take aim at the fuel industry and their predatory actions against indigenous lands and peoples through artistic works that serve as acts of protest in of themselves. The House of Chair Carvers accomplish this by hand carving totem poles that travel hundreds of miles in support of native communities whose land and ways of life face destruction at the hands of oil companies. Winter Cow and their video We Are in Crisis were similarly able to bring awareness to the No Dapple protests that were pl taking place in North Dakota through artistic intervention. Through disembodied imagery of the damage caused by the fuel industry and predatory capitalism to North Dakota land, coupled with powerful storytelling, Winter Cow is able to show solidarity towards the water protectors who were essential to the protests, as well as share the dangers of overconsumption and its effects on indigenous lands. The direct action-based art making that is practiced by Winter Cow and the House of Tear Carvers addresses issues that were unacknowledged by land artists of the 1960s and 70s. Considering that the land art movement is composed of primarily white and male individuals, their art lacked awareness of the dangers of climate injustice, as it was not something that directly impacted their ways of life or livelihoods. This resulted in works that, while aesthetically successful and materially interesting, lacked political depth, other than making mild anti-capitalism claims against the art system. However, the land art movement did contribute to bringing conversations about the natural environment and its connection to human activity to the popular canon, allowing the movement to grow in new directions, which eventually would result in the powerful artwork and protest being created by Winter Cow and the House of Tear Carvers.